Welcome, everybody. Um, glad you could tune in tonight. For those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Terry Lynch with uh, PB Now. Welcome to the December meeting of the Nonprofit Plant Based Nutrition Organization of Wisconsin, or as we like to call it, PB Now. Uh, the mission of our nonprofit group is to inspire, educate, and support each other on an evidence backed plant based nutritional path for health and improved quality of life. Our group is open to everybody, those plant based and those just curious about it. It's meant to be a non judgmental place for people to come, get information and support, and make their own decisions in regard to what direction they wish to pursue. If you'd like more information about our group, you can go to our in our upcoming meeting dates, speakers, um, eventually cooking classes, which you'll hear about a little later tonight, and other resources. You can go to our website, which is pbnow.org. That's pbnow.org. Uh, as we do each time, could I see a show of hands, either by raising your hands if you have your video on, or uh, looking down at the bottom for the um, uh, I'm just looking for it myself here, reactions uh, icon for a thumbs up as to how many of you are currently plant-based or following a plant-based lifestyle. That's good. I see more and more some hands and, and thumbs coming up. Excellent. Well, I, as we mentioned at each meeting, the evidence of the benefits of plant-based nutrition for people of all ages as published in non-biased medical research is quite striking. Whether it's improving health through increased energy, weight loss, preventing slowing, stopping, and reversing problems like allergies, digestive problems, diabetes, heart disease, and early dementia, or increasing our quality of life and helping us feel better with a stronger immune system or endurance, better athletic performance that we'll hear about later, faster recovery from exercise, less painful joints and clearer thinking, as well as reducing the physical, emotional and financial side effects of the drugs and procedures often recommended to treat the problems plant-based nutrition can help us avoid. The research shows our bodies do a wonderful job of healing themselves if we just stop damaging them with poor nutrition and start giving them what they were designed to run on, what they need. It is truly remarkable, as many of you know. The benefits of plant-based nutrition are particularly relevant now, and we'll hear about this a little later during the pandemic, is three of the top pre-existing health conditions that increase chances of people who contract COVID having a serious reaction are high blood pressure, obesity, and diabetes. All of these conditions have been shown in medical research and clinical practice to be improved by plant-based nutrition. Once again, it's quite amazing what your body can do to heal itself if you give it a chance, if you feed it what it needs. Now let me tell you what's in store for you tonight. Uh, we'll hear from uh, three different uh, speakers tonight. First, or I think we'll hear from uh, Dr. Liberman first. I'm just looking to see if he's here. I'll look uh, when I'm done going through this. Um, so we'll eventually hear from uh, Dr. Liberman. We'll also hear from uh, plant-based cooking instructor, Amberly Childs, who will lead a group discussion. And <clears throat> at uh, about 6.40 p.m., excuse me, p.m., we'll begin with our featured speaker, Dr. Chris Miller who will give us a talk followed by about uh, 20 minutes of Q&A. Our, our program should end at 7.30. Um, as a reminder, we have meetings every month, usually on the second Thursday of the month at 6 p.m. Central Time. Uh, our meeting, our next one will be uh, Thursday, January 14th. And you can look for information um, when we post that on the website. We haven't posted uh, that speaker yet on the website, but. Last, a, a quick technical note, uh, during the meeting, I'd ask everybody to, except for the speakers, of course, to remain mute, muted uh, so that everybody can hear and we don't end up with some background noise that makes it difficult to uh, hear the speakers. Uh, during the question and answer, and actually you can turn this on now if you want, you can turn on the chat uh, function down in the middle of the bottom bar on your Zoom screen. 
Uh, if you have questions, don't hesitate to type them in and, and send them in, and then we'll uh, try to get to as many of them as we can during the questions and answers. Uh, and we'll be using the chat box during the discussion as well. Um, all right, so here we go. Let me just check to see if I see Dr. Liverman here, which I do not. So I think we will begin with, um, with the discussion. Let me introduce Amberly. Uh, many of you know Amberly, and those for don't, who don't, uh, she is a plant-based, or she, she is trained through uh, 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 Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine and their Food for Life program as a plant-based uh, cooking instructor and chef. Uh, she does additional things, which at the end of the discussion, uh, Amberly will mention. Uh, but uh, there are a number of uh, uh, Food for Life cooking instructors in the country. Uh, many areas don't have the benefit of having one. We not only have one here in Milwaukee, but she is excellent. So uh, let me welcome Amberly Childs to lead our discussion. Amberly? Hello, thank you so much. Good to see everybody. Um, happy Thursday. I'm uh, traded out of my husband's office for uh, my time to be in here tonight. He's with the baby, I'm in the office. So it's good to be here. Um, and, you know, I know it's December and in, in March kind of COVID kind of hit and we're still there. And so Terry and I are always bouncing ideas back and forth or what would be some good things to talk about. And so um, the topic that we're gonna throw around tonight is food prep um, and not necessarily like how much food prep do you do, but you know, what is it that you do or your family does to prep yourself for the week? Um, and so I'm going to start with myself and give a small example. I'm on a rolling chair, so that's why I'm kind of moving around here. <laughs> um, and so I'll start with myself and um, because what I have come to realize, and I'm a chef, but I still have to cook for my family, right? I still have to prepare meals that my daughter, who's one and a half, will eat, and also food that's maybe a little bit more advanced that my husband and I might like, and our palate maybe is craving. Um, and so what I've come to find out is that I don't have to cook every night. And so that's what the big message and the big takeaway that I want you to hear is that if you spend a little bit of time maybe cooking double or preparing on the weekend, or not, maybe it's not the weekend, maybe you work third shift, maybe you work nights, maybe you, whatever, your challenge, your schedule might be different from person next to you, right? So based on your family schedule and what you have going on, that's when you're like, okay, Mondays are my day to cook or Saturdays are my day to cook. So whenever... I look at getting in the kitchen. I think, how can I maximize my time in this kitchen? And how can I get more than one meal out of that? And the answer is planning. Um, and then the other part of it is, is being flexible with yourself. You are not Martha Stewart. You do not have to put a five course meal on the table every single night. And I think that where, especially when I'm in my cooking classes, I talk with people all the time and this is the feedback that I hear. I just don't know what to do. There's so many nights in the week and, you know, to sit down and to make uh, a, like a, not a hearty dish, but like a complex dish, right? I have to have a, this because when we used to eat meat, right? We were always trained, sit down and eat your meat. You're going to eat your potatoes and you're going to eat your vegetable, your starch and your veggie. And so when you transition to a plant-based diet, a lot of the times you're looking at the same plate, but you've taken off the animal product and now you're like, okay, I have starch and grain or starch and vegetable, right? So what, first thing I think you need to do is throw away the old traditional plate. So the idea of what that plate looks like, because some nights I sit down and I might just have a big bowl of lentils, maybe like, right, I made chili last week, right? For work, a lot of you ordered my chili. And so that chili is gonna purpose my family throughout the week. We're gonna eat it for lunch a couple times. Um, I got kind of excited the other night and we made French fries in the air fryer. And then we put the chili on top of those and then a bunch of raw onions and hot sauce. 
So we took the chili and we turned it into kind of this fun appetizer, which turned into dinner because it was a complex carbohydrate. It was loaded with beans. So if we can start to look at each meal as it doesn't have to be your protein, your starch, your, your, your vegetable, but rather looking at it as this is my meal. And if my meal is a bowl of chili, that's okay for this meal. And so get rid of that idea of the plate. So with I, in my family, what I do, and I kind of try to like draw a little bit um, of, a, of a calendar here for you, just to kind of give you an idea. And so it's not complete, but this is sit down each week and write out Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you got lunch and dinner because breakfast, you're going to do the same thing most of the time, all the time, right? You're going to just whip it up. You're going to kind of do your go-to, but lunch to me is a repurposed version of dinner. And so you always, most of the time, you're going to have some version of greens in there. So you could recreate a bowl. So I'm cooking grains once to twice a week. I try and change the grain that I'm cooking and I cook it into a double batch. So can you double batch your recipes? And then if it's too much for your family, you could freeze some. And so start to think of every time I'm in the kitchen, how can I be making more than one meal? Also thing that I like to do is write down if, if my week, I cook on Sundays. I'm in the kitchen all day on Sunday. So my week doesn't really, I, I kind of look at Saturday as the beginning of my week when I start to do my planning. And so maybe I, I talk with my husband and I say, hey, what are you feeling this week? Do you have any flavors, any profile, anything you want? And he says, I'm really wanting some Mediterranean, maybe some falafel. So then I just run with it, right? Okay, falafel, what goes good with that? Hummus, what kind of hummus could I do? Maybe an olive tapenade hummus. And I just kind of just spitball, fire it off of that Mediterranean idea. And then Maybe I make falafel. Maybe I make a whole lot of falafel so then I can freeze some of that falafel. Now my hummus can be a snack throughout the week. I've made a grain. Maybe I made a couscous. Maybe I have a brown rice. So I've got two different grain versions. And then anything you make, you can always leftovers turn into a bowl of some kind, right? So when I look at my week, Besides the day that I'm cooking for the community, because that's a full day of work, we'll call that not, but I do benefit from that because I get to bring home food and share that with my family, but I am really only cooking three nights a week at my house for a family of two with a child, because I have to be real honest. So tonight we're eating out. My husband has a friend coming over. They're going to sit on our back patio and they're catching up. They haven't seen each other in a while. And so he's bringing over veggie burgers from a, a local business, you know? And so right now during COVID, I try not to beat myself up on the concept of eating out versus I say to myself, Hey, I'm supporting local small business and I'm trying to help my community stay afloat. And I also have to look at where can I maybe get a plant-based meal at one of these restaurants that maybe traditionally isn't plant-based, but I could maneuver some ingredients around. So enough about me. Just wanted to give you guys a couple examples. So now what I'd like to do is turn it over to you all. And so now I want to use the chat box. And we're going to do this and we're just going to kind of spitfire for a little bit. So if you're up to it and you're feeling brave enough, what I'd like you to do is turn your video on. And if you have a, if you want to share, I want you to, how is it that you prep? Is it an idea? Is it based on uh, profiles? Is it based on days that you work? How is it that you start to gather your week and your food and your ingredients and every idea is a good idea? and we want to hear from you. So if you want to message, go into the message box. The trick here is you can message everyone or you can just message me. I'm Amber Lee with an A. And I want to hear some ideas from you all. And while you're getting a moment to type into the box, somebody go ahead and type in. I'm going to read. We've got a question here. And the question is, yeah, so the question is, is about the air fryer and does the food in the air fryer taste as good the next day at lunch? Um, and I would say, you know, if I'm doing, let's say potatoes and I make like crunchy French fries, 
Um, the next day, they're obviously not going to be as crunchy as they would have been when they came fresh out of there. Um, but if it was a quinoa croquette or like a little hot pocket or something like that that I had made, let's say a veggie burger, something like that, it would it would still be crunchy. And if you microwaved it at work or you reheated it, it would retain a little bit of that crunch, but not as much. Um, that's when something like if depending on your workplace would be if you had like a, a little toaster oven, like toaster ovens are really great to heat up anything that used to be fried because it's going to give it that high heat fast and it help recreate that crunch. Okay. All right, Lonnie, I'm going to come back to your air fryer question here in a moment. Um, all right, Chris. Chris Miller is given some feedback. Do you want to come off your, um, Chris, off your uh, mute and turn your video on? You want to tell everybody about your uh, Sunday, what you got going on? That was great, Amber Lee. Thank you. Um, so I like to, on Sundays, yeah, I turn the football game on and I just set up my kitchen and I just try to prep a few recipes for the week. I'm not a gourmet chef like you, so I don't have these fancy ideas. <laughs> even know what to do with Mediterranean, but I flip through a cookbook and we'll make a soup, a chili, um, maybe a stir fry, just kind of what vegetables we have, what are easy for me to run to the store and get. And um, I prep, so I prep a whole bunch on Sunday and put it in the container for the week. Yeah. Well, how great, right? She's not missing her football. And, you know, even if you're like a, a halftime football fan, like someone like myself, then you can kind of like pretend like you're into it, right? I'm like half cooking, I'm half being social. Um, but if you really are, you know, maybe it's not your football. Maybe it's your Netflix series that you're just like, I can't get away from the Queen's Gambit. I got to finish it. Uh, whatever it is, turn that on. That way you're making sure you're finding a little bit of pleasure while you're taking care of yourself. And, and you're always taking care of yourself when you're taking time to cook and to feed your body nourishing, wonderful plant foods, high fibrous foods, but make sure you're getting something else in at the same time. I'm not sure you can exercise and be in the kitchen at the same time, but um, I like that idea, Chris. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, we had another, let's see here. All right, Elaine, Elaine, you want to um, come off mute and share um, what you have going on? You're still muted, Elaine. There you go. You guys hear me? Yep. yep. Okay. Um, well, much like I said, I, I try to uh, keep some kind of grains on hand, like rice or millet or quinoa, what have you. In fact, I've got some cooking right now. And um, so that I'll, I'll use throughout the week. Um, I keep some wraps on hand. I keep steamed potatoes on hand. And for a while there, I was um, donating my plasma and I was always having trouble getting my iron and my um, protein up. So uh, with the iron, I was doing a ton of kale and chard and all this stuff. Um, so I stopped doing that because I was getting turned away too often and I didn't want to take iron supplements, but I've continued to eat that way. And um, so I'll just, in a big walk, I'll make, I'll throw in mushrooms and onions and garlic and stuff. I tend to make too much because it's just for myself and I have a dog, so it doesn't <laughs> let me fail. Um, and so I repurpose it the next day. I might chop it up finely, add some tofu, put it in a breakfast burrito wrap, add some potato to it and I, or rice and beans. And I'm, I'm making this combination of stuff throughout the week and I don't get tired of it. It's, it's, I love it. So yeah, and adding hot pepper flakes or sriracha or lemon pepper or what have you just to spice it up and give it a different flavor on the, whatever given day. I love that. Lemon pepper is really good. So adding acid to anything can replace the salt or at least be a starter. That way you don't have to salt from the, the beginning. You can add an acid first. And by adding that lemon on there, I really like that because then you can kind of hold off on the salt and it will really change the flavor profile of a lot of different things that we're eating just by adding a, a little bit of acid to it. Um, but those were some great suggestions, Elaine. And here's the note that I took that I wanted all of you to hear if you did it from what she shared, repurpose your food. Okay, how great to think if we can reduce, reuse, recycle, 
everything in our lives, right? Why not repurpose our food? Tonight, it could be Mexican. Tomorrow, it could be a bowl that maybe you change the dressing on. Instead of a cilantro dressing, maybe you put um, a little bit of soy sauce on it and you can then all of a sudden turn it into an Asian flavor dish, maybe a little tahini you could put on there. So repurposing our food will allow us to continue to eat some of the things we've already cooked just like Chris was sharing, she's making a chili, she's making a saute, she's got a, she's got a few different things going and then we can use those together or we can repurpose them throughout the week. And don't be afraid to take your hot items and put them on top of greens and don't be afraid to add grains on your greens and you can make a really good healthy hearty salad that's not just raw. Thank you, Elaine, for sharing. All right, let's see here. I got a couple more in the queue. Terry, give me a thumbs up if we're doing okay on time. Um, yep. Okay, let's see. We got just a couple more here. How about Cindy? Cindy Schmidt, you want to tell us about what you got going on? And then and after, I don't... And, after that, I see Warren Bergman, too. All right, so Cindy, if you're, I can share your ideas on here. She makes pizza, um, makes enough for more than one meal, right? Like whether you're just making a little individual kind of um, a pita that you're going to turn into, is it a, is it a whole grain um, pita or something like that that you're going to turn into a personal, or are you going to go to the store um, and buy, like I love it, Sendix, they have these, I don't know at Trader Joe's they do, but they already have the dough ready for you. Take it home, roll it out yourself, um, and you can make your own pizzas. You could portion that dough into smaller sections and then make smaller little pizzas. Um, that way everyone kind of gets their own personal pan, if you will. All right, Warren, Warren's got a couple of ideas. Warren, would you like to share with us? Uh, sure, I will. Um, to make sure that we have greens every morning for breakfast, I like to steam a whole bunch um, at once. Um, but I'm looking for some input here because the problem is that not everyone in the family enjoys the greens after they've been in the fridge for two or three or four days. I, I like it, but so I wonder if anyone has, has tried uh, putting the vinegar on right away, mixing, mixing vinegar in with the greens right away, if that acts as a preservative or something to, to, to help keep them fresh. Well, it's a little bit of both. So the vinegar does help kind of preserve it, but at the same time, it also breaks down some of the toughness in the greens. So it does a little bit of both. So I think depending on how much you're cooking the greens, um, you know, if you know you're going to have them go for four days, right, maybe cook them less. So then as the acid sits on them, it can slowly cook it, like break it down a little bit more as it's in the fridge okay. versus if you were just going to have them all of your greens on day one or two, um, then maybe cook them a little bit more. So sure. then they seem a little bit more fresh when you're eating them versus they've been in there you know, for a couple days and you're like, because what happens is, is visually we turn ourselves off. You're like, I've seen this container <laughs> for a couple of days now. And we start psyching ourselves out. We're like, do I really want to eat that? Um, and then we start to kind of entertain some, some other idea. I see. Um, could you put the greens in? So like, so you all know, I, I cook all day Sunday and then I deliver all the soups on Monday. And so every Sunday, what I take to work with me is like a, a hot packet. It's a glass container with a lid. Um, but what it is, 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 and I got it on Amazon. It's just a little zipper packet and it has a small little heater on the bottom and it plugs into the wall. And so I will put in my glass container and any glass piece works, any really high end plastic would work, but I prefer glass. And I put my grains in the bottom. I, um, I had just some Ethiopian food last week and didn't eat it all. So I used half of, of what was left over in that. And then a little bit of, of some other food that I had. And I just did strip. I had the grains on the bottom and then I just did a strip. Here are some strips of the cabbage. Here were some strips of the, the, the greens I was eating were kale and collards, both cooked down. 
-hmm. I add a little bit of water to that and then it kind of starts to steam itself. And then it typically takes about an hour to reheat. And then I unplug it when I'm ready to eat lunch, it's all nice and warm. So by adding the greens into the, the grains and then and, and putting a little bit of water in that when I reconstructed it and heated it, um, I didn't find that the grains, the greens, excuse me, bothered me as much. They didn't seem to kind of wilt down as much because some of their juices were absorbed by the grain that was in there and the other um, things that I had in there. Mm -hmm. So maybe if you didn't have all the greens together, maybe you portioned them out into some other containers that maybe had rice in it. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they wouldn't sit in the same juices and kind of soften down as much. I see. Just an idea. Thank you. But I like the idea that you're eating greens for breakfast. You're probably maybe a step ahead of some of us on this call. <laughs> uh, I think that's pretty stellar. That's, um, a, that's an Esselstyn thing. Yes. It will get them in, right? Get them in anytime you can. But if you get them in early in the morning, right? It's like mm -hmm. the workout early, right? Check, check check. So that's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Okay. Show, you see uh, Becky Schultz. No, oh, I'm on the, hold You on. see that, Emily? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Becky, are you uh, able to unmute? I am able to unmute. I'm not yes, sure I want to unvideo because <laughs> I, I haven't, like, I, I'm kind of in almost the same position as I was this morning, but I will, I will. No, um, it's all good. You, that's, whatever that's you're fine. comfortable with, your okay. ideas are what we want to hear. <laughs> okay, I'm in the dark, so I'll do it. Um, okay, hi. Wow. Um, <laughs> I got in from a run and then I kind of just a mess. So anyway, um, I just made really cute little pizzas that were on some um, gluten-free flatbreads. And then I just did a little bit of sauce with marinara sauce. You could use a pizza sauce if you wanted to and put up various toppings on. And so you can make, um, <laughs> there you go. Um, and then you could use like a, this nutritional yeast slash zucchini mix if you want to for like a cheese. I mean, if you want to put a little bit of cheese on it, you could do it, I suppose. But I know that that's kind of not where a lot of us are going. And then put the ba uh, basil and oregano on it and sprinkle some red pepper on it. It was really, really yummy. And then have it with a nice uh, green salad of all kinds with um, a nice dressing. And I use my dehydrator because my oven um, needs a replacement. And so it was just like these little almost flatbreads in a way that just, but they were, they were kind of they were pizza and they were really a lovely way of getting some nice nutrition and filling a, a craving and then having it with a nice salad. That's really great. Thanks, Rick. I, I'll throw something in here too, Amberly. Um, <clears throat> this is, I don't know if this is particular to guys, but uh, uh, um, you know, the easy way of going about doing things. So uh, this has uh, no cooking involved. Uh, for those of you who know where beans and barley is, uh, I go to beans and barley probably every other week. Uh, and my wife and I will get, so they've got uh, some great things there. But one of the things they have is a black bean burrito, which uh, fits all of the things that we're talking about uh, here. And I'll buy, um, you know, I'll get one for myself uh, and get four extra ones, bring them back and stick them in the freezer. And I know some people maybe uh, are not microwave people, but uh, I'm okay with that. And we to always take the, um, uh, the aluminum foil off before I stick them in there. So that's my contribution, I guess. Uh, and then uh, put them in and, and put it on three minutes uh, after leaving them on the counter for a while, to, uh, you know, taking them out earlier in the day to warm them up a little bit. And that's... Uh, I, I, that's not bulk cooking, it's bulk buying. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that, that works real well. And I, I've got a question for you and maybe for Dr. Miller too, uh, talking about the greens um, and greens in the morning. So I like to try to get a smoothie. Uh, I've got a smoothie that's half um, trunk here, but um, a green, uh, green, largely greens, you know, um, the, the um, very fresh, um, 
uh, right now, lacinato kale or collards, that type of thing with uh, a couple bags of uh, frozen fruit, uh, a banana, uh, some, uh, as Dr. Miller knows, some uh, chia seed, some flax seed. Uh, and if I've got some uh, broccoli sprouts, throw that in there too. And uh, it's uh, it, it, for some people, it might be a little greeny tasting, but for those of us who are really into greens, you know, it, it tastes uh, really good. But my question is, you know, I may, I'll, I'll make some during the day, but in the morning, I don't want to be turning on our very loud blend tech to uh, wake up anybody else if I've gotten up earlier. So I'll leave uh, one or two of these. I'll make maybe five of them in a, at a time, five, 16 ounce, ounce glasses. Uh, and leave a couple of them in there to have the next day. And am I losing much in the way of nutrition, keeping them in the in the fridge overnight, instead of doing it the same day? Um, well, I can answer uh, first. But, um, so a little bit. So the the uh, the greens are best when they're fresh. You blend it up. You're releasing all these beautiful phytonutrients. They're forming the bond. The um, the healing nutrients that we want, the ITCs they're called and the DIM and all these wonderful things from the great foods you have. And so um, the sooner you drink it, the better. But that being said, studies have shown that usually within about 24 hours, it still retains enough nutrition that you're gonna get the anti-inflammatory and some of the healing benefits of it, which is why you're probably drinking it. And so um, if you put it, put a lid on it, um, I have my smoothie in this type of container and I put a piece of tape over this, take the straw, put a piece of tape on. And so it's sealed, um, or you, I put it in a mason jar with a sealed lid, put it in the fridge, so it's airtight. And if you're making them later in the day, then it should last, you can get away with it the following morning, so. Sounds great. Yeah, Thanks. sure. And uh, just to answer Warren here, uh, do the beans and barley burritos come in an SOS free whole grain tortilla? That's a good question, Warren, I'm not sure. They come in a tortilla, but I'm not sure that it's uh, mm -hmm. SOS free. But the ingredients that are on the inside, I don't, I don't know if they use any oil. They may use a little bit, but uh, the rest of the ingredients are are uh, pretty, pretty clean and healthy, and uh, and I love. Them. I can, eat, I can eat them every day. Well, I'm just gonna um, finish up right off of Terry there, piggyback off of that because burritos are one of the best purpose meals you could ever have so this is a great segue Terry so one whatever you're eating okay and you have left over you could always put into a burrito right and so think of it if you know the bigger the um, the tortilla the easier it's going to be and I'll tell you this less is more you always want less but basically whatever you have, let's say I had leftover chili, right? I could then take that chili, I could then put a little bit into the burrito, roll it up, I could throw some raw onion in there, I could throw some hot sauce, however I like my burrito, roll it up, okay, keep them smaller, better, right? Less inside because, you know, we've all seen them rolling a burrito at Chipotle and you're like, come on, you're not rolling anything. <laughs> you know, it just looks like a big tub. Um, but once you get the burritos rolled, okay, depending if it's a small tortilla or a big one, either one of them work. You wanna wrap them in wax paper and then you can take that wax paper and you can then roll it in aluminum foil or you could put it into a Ziploc bag, freeze them. Because they are individual in wax paper, you can pull them out as you need them and then you could put them in your air fryer, you could put them in your toaster oven and you would be able to then have a nice warm crunchy tor crunchy burrito that you are repurposing from a little bit of chili that you were like, no, so am I gonna really eat this little bit of chili? Am I gonna eat this little bit of greens? But if I put them together with a little hot sauce, I can turn them in to a really great burrito that I might eat in three weeks because I put it in the freezer and I froze it. So freeze burritos, you can um, really save all your food. So. Excellent. Thank, Thank you, you all so much for participating and sharing your ideas. If we didn't get to you, I apologize. 
Um, but we were going to continue. The other thing I want to share is if there's something that you like to talk about or learn about, um, maybe you are ha have a great wealth of knowledge in regards to something that you want to share with us. We want to hear about it. So message Terry, send an email, put it in the chat box of a topic or an idea that you have in an upcoming meeting. It might just be the next thing that we're going to talk about. So thank you all for your ideas. Every idea is great and they help all of us try to get out of our ruts and try and just stay the course on being healthy and living an optimal life. So thank you guys. I appreciate it. Thanks, Amberly. And I, and I would just uh, echo by Amberly's comment there about if you've got ideas, don't hesitate to, to either uh, email or stick them in the chat box here. Uh, and that, uh, and we'll, try to get to these we're looking for we want to we want to make sure that we're uh, giving you the kind of information that you all have an interest in and, and like to learn about so it's uh, makes a, it makes a lot more sense for us to hear from you what you'd like to do so with that let's go to our guest speaker tonight um, our guest speaker is a physician double board certified in emergency and integrative medicine she worked for 10 years in the emergency department and served as president of Colorado's chapter of the American College of Emergency Physicians, where she advocated for the care of emergency patients and physicians. Due to her own health concerns and the overwhelming amount of chronic disease she saw every day, she radically changed her practice to lifestyle medicine and health promotion. She studied nutritional science and he has completed a fellowship in integrative and functional medicine. In 2013, she opened her own lifestyle medicine practice and founded the Eat and Live Healthfully website and blog. She now focuses exclusively on nutrition and lifestyle changes to get to the root cause of disease and illness and helps empower people to take back their health essentially keeping people out of the emergency department. In 2018, she was medical director at Aspen Valley Hospital and created their integrative medicine program. She was also selected to be a member of the Pitkin County Board of Health, where she helped with policy and public health concerns. In 2019, she moved to New Hampshire, where she'll be speaking to us from tonight where she currently does clinical work see seeing patients, teaching classes, giving talks, and reaching out to the community. She is also one of the founding doctors of plantbasedtelehealth.com, where she provides health counseling to people in 18 states, including Wisconsin, by the way. I'm happy to welcome Dr. Chris Miller. Dr. Miller? Thank you so much, Terry, for that um, introduction. And thank you uh, to all of you guys for having me here tonight. I know you've had some amazing speakers and it's, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Just making sure. Um, and I, and it's, it's, it's really great to be um, included here. And um, so thank you very much. I've been looking forward to this. Um, I was going to, uh, Terry and I were talking about a couple different topics for, for us to talk about today. And first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. And um, then he wanted, he had seen, I, I'd given a couple of talks on athlete performance and um, enhancing both health, fitness, and athletic performance. And so we decided we were going to talk about that. And then I told him I had some really interesting stuff that I learned about the immune system and food and their intersection and how it impacts and so we were just chatting and so then we decided to include that too so now we're, it's kind of a hodgepodge if you will so we'll see how this goes I'm watching my clock and uh, hopefully this will go well so uh, and then we'll take questions at the end so first a little bit about me um, so you heard from the introduction that I practice in the ER and I loved it I love being an emergency room doctor and I felt like it was my calling uh, and then I got sick one day I started to have swelling in my fingers um, started with one finger and um, then it went to another finger and another, and I knew, oh my gosh, this is gonna be autoimmune, but I don't have any autoimmune in my family. So it kind of caught me off guard and I didn't know what to think. And I'm not sick, I'm a doctor, I'm not supposed to be. So I was totally blindsided by this. And I went in and got tests done and everything was positive. I had a million antibodies, like literally everything lit up 
for lupus, not a million, but like everything was positive. And, and usually it's hard to diagnose it. People with autoimmune know that it often can take years and people just don't feel right. And we're not really sure what's going on, but mine wasn't like that. It was just, everything was positive, which means it'd been going on for a while, right? Cause autoimmune diseases take time to develop. So I took all the medications they gave me. It started with three medications and I went to four and five and six. And within a year and a half, I was on six medications, including three major immunosuppressives. I was taking 90 milligrams of prednisone at one point because I was having pains when I was breathing. I couldn't lay down and it didn't touch it. I was taking uh, two anti-cancer uh, medications, chemotherapy to just knock out my immune system. And it wasn't touching it. I had so much inflammation and and then my, this was making my blood pressure go up and my cholesterol go up by being on these steroids. And so I had to go on blood pressure medicine, cholesterol medicines, and I was so anxious and I was totally depressed and crying every day. It was so hard. So I can relate with people who, if, if anyone has ever felt that way. Uh, and so on my own, I was started thinking, I got to do something. And my doctor said, yeah, we're going to try some experimental drugs because you're not really um, doing well so far with these meds. And I was freaked out by that. So I started doing research. This is 10 years ago now. So it's before all these wonderful forums and blogs and posts and groups and before forks or knives, or at least for me, I hadn't heard of anyone or any of this. Nobody told me about my diet or my lifestyle. Um, so I didn't know any of this. And so I started doing some research and I actually came up with some good information about lupus and diet. And thankfully it was a plant-based uh, people. And, and I learned about it from Dr. Um, Furman and from... Um, Dr. McDougall and I started reading everything I could read and, and just like probably most of you guys out there reading uh, the China study and I mean the evidence is there and I couldn't believe it and I was reading uh, Dean Ornish right and he's published in American cardiology journals and this was before my time I mean this was like in the 90s he had articles coming out so I hadn't learned this in medical school so I was really I was flabbergasted and so I flew out to conferences and I I learned everything I could, learned recipes, and I switched my diet because I was so scared not to. I didn't know what else to do. And and I've been, it's been a slow progress. It was not one of those stories like Forks Over Knives where I switched my diet and three months later, everything is perfect. Um, it was a lot harder. I had food sensitivities and I switched to plant-based. My body didn't like a lot of these foods. So I kept having all sorts of symptoms, but I saw the science and I knew that this was the direction I had to go. So I kept going in that direction and I, I kept getting a little bit at a time better chipping away at it and better and better. And it was able to start, you know, taking off some of these medications. I didn't need them anymore. And, and so I made a, a significant progress, just getting better and better. And over time, patients would come to see me in the ER, you know, they were having heart attacks and they were having asthma exacerbations. And I wanted to ask, you know, I don't have time. They're sick. They're emergency patients. We've got to move quickly but I wanted to ask them what they were eating and how they were living and what was going on in their lives. And I'll tell you, everybody's stressed before they have a heart attack. So really manage your stress because it's not good for our hearts. Um, but I, it just wasn't working for me at this point. And I ended up opening my own practice. And from there, it just flourished, just word of mouth. People were interested in this. And it's been so much fun for me now to work on this end and help people prevent disease and, and reverse and stop, halt it, or do everything we can. And I'm always studying and researching and learning any new science that comes out. What else can we do? What's that edge that we need? And, and that's why I studied integrated medicine, because I wanted to know if, um, you know, the mind body tricks were, would be helpful or if they're, what is it about herbs? Is there a reason that people are using them? Is there anything to it? Um, what about these other techniques in addition to the plant-based diet? And so I learned whatever I could I, to have tools in the toolkit so that if people come and see me with something, we can do the dietary changes. We can work on these other uh, factors that we need to, to really help optimize our health. And it's like Terry said, it's amazing what the body can do when you just step back and give it the tools and take away everything else. And our bodies heal, like they really do heal. So um, that is my introduction sort of to who I am. And I love, I got to work with plant-based telehealth. Um, I was lucky to be one of the first people to join because they're good friends of mine. And um, it's been so fun because we get to work with people all over the country who are just really motivated, inspired, or just learning about it and just want to know more. And so um, it's been really fun to get to see people making changes and getting improvements and helping them um, improve their health from all sorts of things, from diabetes to high blood pressure to autoimmune diseases to several patients with cancer, um, hypothyroid, all sorts of things that we can work together and get can see, can see improvements. So it's been, I've been lucky to get to do this. 
Um, and so with that, I'd like, I say we jump into the COVID stuff and then we'll get into the sports. And it was kind of, um, I hope you guys don't mind this hodgepodge, but the COVID was just really interesting to me. And so um, I wanted to share a little bit of that with you guys, just because of the times that we're in right now, obviously. And, but then Terry had the idea that we were all hearing about COVID left and right. That's all we hear about, which is totally true. And, and maybe we need something more uplifting. And so we're, we thought we'd tie in the sports part. So um, we'll jump into the COVID and then the rest of the talk will be the sports until we run out of time and then we'll stop. <laughs> um, should I share, I guess I can share my screen now. You should be able to. Okay, share screen. Okay, share. There we go. Got it. All right. Looks like it's working. Okay. Can you guys see that? Yes. Okay, great. We, um, see, your, we see your entire screen, so we see this both sides. Yeah, so I'll get, I'll make it into a slideshow. Play from start. Okay, here we go. The power of plants. So um, we're going to talk about food and the immune system and, oops, and um, and then exercise and movement type stuff. So here we go. Okay, um, so I just went over that. Immune supporting benefits of plant-based diet in the times of COVID-19 and take home tips to maximize performance, fitness and optimal health. So hopefully this will flow. <laughs> um, so start to start with, um, it's just crazy times obviously. And so we're all thinking about what we can do to prevent it or if we get it to not have it severe or to prevent post COVID sy symptoms, right? And we're not gonna talk today about all the COVID. Um, I could talk forever about the immune system and COVID and what's going on, but that's what, not what today's about. Um, today's about actually where the food and the immune system kind of come together and intersect. And um, it's about what we can do to step up our own prevention and how we can be our healthiest selves. So if we do get it, we, we have some protection because remember, we're not, we're not just sitting here waiting to see if something happens. We actually have a defense system that's designed for this exact thing. We're always exposed to new viruses and new bacteria, new everything in the environment and, and new toxins and our body's designed to get rid of them, right? And so we really wanna step that up right now. This is the time to not have ongoing inflammation. Don't start off with a site extra cytokines so that you get, you run into trouble and have an immune system that can, can actually get rid of it. So that's what we're going to talk about just for like a few minutes. It's not very long. Um, so this current solutions right now that we know of are preventative. So um, stay home, wear a mask, uh, social distance, wash your hands, all wonderful tips. And I agree with them all. So very important to do all of that. Then we, if someone does get sick with something, we have antivirals such as remdesivir, which um, has some studies maybe showing some benefits. Some studies showing maybe not quite, but but there is some benefits to the to remdesivir in some studies. Then anti-inflammatories definitely play a role, and that is things like um, the dexamethasone, and that's going to be for later on when you get that cytokine storm. So you know, there's the initial part where the virus is attacking, and you want your initial immune system to really go at it, and then there's the secondary part where you get that too many cytokines, it's, your immune system is going crazy and you get the cytokine um, storm that they're calling it. And so the anti-inflammatories have been shown to be helpful to there. And then um, the vaccine, which we're watching all, I know we're all watching that. So hopefully that's going to help out um, very shortly for, for people. And then enhance immune function. So um, in general, just to be more efficient and do its job the way it's supposed to do. So that's kind of the solutions that we know of. And so today we're going to obviously talk about enhanced immune function. So goals of foods to fight COVID are, um, like I said, there's two parts of the immune system. There's the innate, the initial part of the immune system, which responds to everything, no matter what the if foreign invader is, whether it's bacteria, whether it's a parasite, whether it's a toxin, whether it's a virus, it's the front end where it's just non-specific, but it's there, boom, and it's going to help recognize an abnormal cell and get rid of it. So we wanna improve that, make it as strong as we can. But, um, and, and another thing we can do is prevent coronavirus from binding, right? There's been a lot of evidence that it binds to this ACE2 receptor. So we wanna prevent that from happening if we can and reduce inflammation and the cytokine response. This is the later part now. So by living in a non-inflammatory state, we hopefully will, if, 
if we do get exposed, we're not going to have that inflammatory and have the bad outcome. Support the microbiome. There's quite a bit coming out about the microbiome and COVID. And I love learning everything microbiome. It's just been so interesting. And so there's a, a bunch coming out about that and how it intercepts with the actual immune system. So why it's important and enhance our vaccine response. One of the problems with vaccines <clears throat> and especially for immunocompromised people or older people is that they're not as effective. And so for things like the flu shot, we often give people a higher amount or the pneumo, pneumonia vaccine, people get a higher amount because they don't generate a response. And um, what they're finding out is that there's certain things we can do to actually generate a better response. Um, so we're gonna talk about the points of intersection where food affects the immune system. Um, so we're, we don't have to know all these things, but I just kind of put them out there. So IgA is immunoglobulin A, it's a general antibody and it coats all of our uh, mucous membranes and it kind of coats all of our bodies. It's the initial antibody, it's just generic, it reacts to everything. So if you breathe something in, it's lining your nose and it's gonna grab it and get rid of it. If you eat something, IgA is in your gut, it's gonna recognize that there's Say there's some salmonella in your food, IgA might be there and help get rid of it. Maybe you never get sick with it. So IgA is a powerful um, antibody that we want to have a good amount of ready to work. Then there's the endothelium of your, and I'm talking endothelium of your gut and of your lungs and of your nose, sort of. So if you breathe it in, endothelium is the membrane itself, the one cell layer membrane itself, the endothelium of your gut, the endothelium of your nose, of your lungs. Um, and, then, and of the blood vessels, right? But there's immune cells that are secreted that are living kind of right around that endothelium that play a role. And so you want the endothelium functioning well, and you want them to have all of these immune, uh, immune cells. So some of the ones that are, are gonna show up there are gamma delta T cells, uh, interferon gamma, which I don't have listed there, memory T cells and natural killer cells, which do exactly what they sound like. They just recognize an abnormal, a virus or bacteria or, or an abnormal cell, like a cancer cell, and it, it basically releases um, uh, like lysis, lys, lysomes that um, kind of release toxins or it actually just gets rid of the cell, kind of grabs and gets rid of it. And then um, we're also where the receptors where the actual COVID, um, the coronavirus binds and actually gets into your body. So those receptors is another place of interface and then the microbiome, like I talked about. So just real quickly, um, I'm going to talk about different foods that we can eat that can enhance this response. Um, so if we can enhance these types of things, there's studies now showing that this actually prevents people from having either less severe of it, of, it, of um, COVID symptoms or not having the outcome, the bad out long-term outcome um, or and even recovering. So we want to do everything we can. So what are the foods? And first we want to enhance that initial immune response. And so um, I should make you guys see if you guys can guess them. I bet you can guess most of these um, with maybe just a couple surprises, but mushrooms. We all have heard a lot about mushrooms probably if you're in the plant-based world. And so what they have been shown is to increase secretary IgA antibodies by as much as 144% in just one week. Um, and it's, it's the beta glucan found in it, which is a prebiotic fiber found in the mushrooms that has the most immunomodular effect. And you wanna be sure to eat the stems too, because the stems actually have 30% more of the beta uh, glucan than the caps themselves. So eating just about half a cup or even a little less, always cook your mushrooms to deactivate a toxin that can affect some people's livers. But, um, and all mushrooms were good. The study was done just with like button mushrooms, cremini, but you can eat portobello, maitake, shiitake, um, all the rare ones. Diversity is good because it helps. So um, that's the first one. The second food, those are cranberries. So perfect right now, this time of year, we're in between Thanksgiving and Christmas, but it's the cranberry polyphenols enhance the gamma delta T cells, which are part of that initial rapid response. And people who were eating, who were drinking cranberry juice, unsweetened cranberry juice, um, had 16% less cold and flu symptoms, 51% less GI distress, and 31% less missed days at school. And um, this was 172% increase in gamma delta T cells. So um, significantly boosted the immune system. And that was unique to cranberries actually. Uh, the next one that really touch base, touches base with the immune system here is blueberries, blackberries, and pomegranates. So these anthocyanides of these deep colored fruits activated the natural killer cells. And people who were eating them had significantly higher natural killer cells, which affected the virus, um, viral infected and abnormal cells. So 
um, hopefully most of us are already eating those on our diets. And, and pomegranates are in season, so those are that's perfect for us right now. Um, garlic, this is a kind of a known, well-known one that garlic is very important for the immune system on all levels. Everything I just showed you, um, the, the garlic is going to intersect. So it's the compound allium sativum in garlic that, that stimulates macrophages, lymphocytes, natural killer cells again, dendrites, dendritic cells, and eosinophils. Those are all parts of the immune system. Um, so it's both the early response is really ramped up by eating garlic and the later response is also um, decreased. So the less cytokine storm, less inflammation, it kind of modulates the immune system. Actually, mushrooms do that a little bit too. Um, so garlic is a really good thing. Interestingly, it has benefits when it's cooked and when it's dried and when it's aged, all that does. But truthfully for viral protection, raw garlic is the best. So if you could sneak it into, we might need um, to find out more recipes with garlic to see how we can sneak a little garlic into um, salad dressings or dishes like that. Um, but hopefully we're eating that most days now. The next one is a little surprise to me anyway, but fermented vegetables. So there's been a lot of evidence about this lately, more and more talk about it and several books people have written lately about fermented vegetables. But what they found was um, that this was an article in BMG in British Medical Journal that that eating um, fermented vegetables in countries where they ate more fermented vegetables, they had less um, severe COVID-19 symptoms. And they found that it was the lactobacillus from the fermented vegetables that increased um, interferon gamma and led to a more robust response, again, initial response against COVID-19. So people weren't having such a bad outcome. Um, in, in that study, it tells you what percentage, but uh, it was significant enough that it made the cut. And then the last one is here, there's so many more, but these are kind of the highlights for today is cruciferous vegetables. So that's gonna be your kale, your broccoli, your Brussels sprouts, your cauliflower, your cabbage, that whole family of them, all of them are good. And um, there's a lot of talk about cruciferous vegetables and for all the reasons it's good. First of all, it has all the vitamins that we need packed with vitamin C, packed with um, all the B vitamins that we need. And then it's also when you break it down, when you chew it, when you blend it, or when you um, cut it, it, it activates the anthocyanate or the um, isothiocyanates and those become um, powerhouses for uh, destroying viruses and bacteria. So eating the cruciferous vegetables every day is really important. So then preventing coronavirus from binding to the receptor and actually entering our body. And this was an interesting one to me too, this is seaweed. So seaweed has been shown that um, it's the sulfated polysaccharides in seaweed, which bind to the ACE2 receptor and actually kind of gum it up so the COVID-19 can't bind to it. So it didn't take very much at all. And they looked, this was a study done in Wuhan, China, and in Japan, where they noticed that people who were eating the seaweed did not have um, such high viral loads and weren't getting as sick. So um, these were small studies, but it didn't take very much at all. And so um, just adding a touch of kelp or a touch of nori or something like this, even just like once a week and not a lot. You have to be careful with the iodine and there's a ton of salt in some of them. So um, you wanna be mindful of that, but maybe just a way of just having a touch of it in a soup or a broth or something like that, just to get a little bit of that benefit. Um, oops. Reducing inflammation, the cytokine response. So now we're talking more about the late response and um, oops. And this is where I put my green smoothie there. And there was a question about um, blending greens versus chewing them. And isn't it better to chew them? And so that's what they used to say, like Dr. Esselstyn and um, some of those um, people used to say, no, no, it has to be chewed because it activates the nitrate that the enzyme in your mouth activates it. But that's actually not show, being shown to be true. And what they did, there was a recent study in the American Journal of Lifestyle Medicine where they gave people green um, smoothies, 32 ounces of green smoothies, and they found that they reduced their CRPs and their inflammation by 75%, with, and it was the dark leafy greens that did it. Um, and so people who were just on a plant-based diet reduced it by 30%, people on a, um, drinking the, the 32 ounces of dark green leafy green smoothie reduced it by 75%. So blending it, it does activate those isothiocyanates and you get the benefits of it. And so um, drinking the green smoothies is just a fast way. And in fact, one of the things is if you eat a salad, 
how fast are, are we really chewing it till it's a liquid? Dr. Clapper always says that chew it till it's a liquid and then swallow it. Well, you know how long it takes to eat a salad if you really chew every bite till it's a liquid? It's hard, it's hard to do. And so we're missing a lot of the nutrients because we don't chew it enough. And so when we blend it, actually we find that people are reducing inflammation and inflammatory states when I treat people um, the green smoothie has been a helpful tool, but it has to be done correctly. Mostly greens, not mostly fruit, not mostly peanut butter, not, not dried fruit, not all that. So it is kind of the way Terry described his as kind of a bitter, a green thing that then maybe put a little lemon in it, or you put a little raspberries or strawberries kind of take away the edge a little bit, something like that, a little ginger without having to do tons of fruit. So, but that is, that's the green smoothie it significantly works for reducing inflammation. Um, cruciferous vegetables, again, highly anti-inflammatory, no surprise there. And then vitamin C, and you can get your vitamin C from all sorts of fruits and vegetables. You see some of them, the picture there. And what I would say about vitamin C is people on a plant-based diet, um, we often cook a lot of our food, even steaming your vegetables. If you lightly steam it, you might still be getting vitamin C, but if we over steam them or if we overcook them, we lose the vitamin C, vitamin C and the B vitamins, they're very heat Label. So heating them up destroys the vitamin C. So we've got to eat some raw, which is why everyone should be eating a, a large salad a day. Um, or if they choose to maybe having a little bit of a green smoothie or eating broccoli and hummus or make sure you get some raw veggies in you as well as cooked. There's definitely benefits to cooked too, but um, for the vitamin C and the B vitamins, actually, you need to have them be raw. Okay. What about the microbiome? Because now we know the microbiome is a major point to in um, the intersection between the outside world and our food and uh, the immune system. So no surprise here, plant-based diet. So to all of you guys for being plant-based or almost plant-based or plant curious, this is great. This is a great first start. The fiber in it, the, the antioxidants, the polyphenols, which are in your dark berries work directly on the microbiome to put out inflammation and help strengthen them. Um, so really important. So that's a great first step wherever you are. That's, that's good. Um, and then on top of that is enhancing foods with soluble fiber, which is a type of fiber that actually, um, helps, um, support becomes like food for the microbiome. That's what they actually break down and ferment and become more tolerant and more in, and work function in a quieter way, less reactive to help prevent things like that cytokine storm. And so those are found in things like potatoes, both white potatoes and sweet potatoes, rice, um, especially when you let you cook it and then you let it cool, um, barley, oats, as well as um, some of your some of your fruits like bananas, um, things like artichokes. You see some of the examples there, but also just eating a plant based diet and not not like a vegan junk food diet, but like a real plant based diet. It sounds like you guys are. From what I just heard, you guys are right on track, and so you're going to get this. Um, cruciferous vegetables, they're right there, all over the place. And fermented foods also, um, the lactobacillus again, uh, in the, especially, I'm sure it's others in there, but that right now there's a really good study about that lactobacillus from the fermented foods. If you have high blood pressure, you have to be mindful of your salt. Some people with autoimmune diseases don't tolerate um, the fermented foods, so you have to wait. And some people with gut issues don't tolerate. So um, just because these are good foods, for certain things, you may not be able to add it right now, or you may have to add just a very little bit or just see how you do with it. But if you can tolerate a little bit of fermented food and it's not too heavily salted, um, just that small amount doesn't take a lot, but can kind of help your gut a little bit. And then the vaccine response. Um, so this was, this is no surprise really, but broccoli and even broccoli uh, sprouts enhance the vaccine response. We don't know to the COVID yet because it's so such a new vaccine, but to the flu and to other vaccines, it increased 22 times more effective in people who are eating broccoli sprouts for just three days at a time, just one ounce, which I say just one ounce, that's actually a good amount because they're pretty light, but um, they're eating an ounce of it for three days before and they had 22 times. So it's something that um, as the vaccine gets closer, we should be eating them anyway, but um, it's something to make sure you're eating. And then prevention, of course, everything you guys can do is really going to be important. So, um, okay, now we're switching directions. I think I have about not much time, actually. Um, Terry, should I keep going or should we switch over or what do you think? Sure, Wait. we've got uh, it, it, and maybe another uh, 10 minutes, something like that. Okay, so I'm watching my clock. I don't want to over speak. Yeah, so I if time wants to people past that 7:30. Okay. Uh, so we'll go. Want to. 
We'll go for 10 minutes and we'll just kind of do an introduction to this. So this is about the importance of being really healthy is the number one thing. And that's what we're all working on here together. And then fitness is also really important to being healthy. So um, we have to be moving our bodies and building muscle mass and strength and, and fitness. And then performance is not everybody, but for those people who are performance, it's really important that we have the health and the fitness first. Not just because you're a performance athlete does not mean you're healthy unless you're taking good care of yourself. So um, we, it's just really important. Um, for this is just to show that basically with active living, so light, moderate activity. So that's it, going for a walk, doing your housework, vacuuming, dusting, cooking dinner, running around in the kitchen. Um, and so that's going to be active living. And you can see that anywhere from 10 minutes to an hour, two hours, look at the benefits, humongous benefits. So every single person should be active. Even in COVID, we're, we're moving in place. Even on days we don't feel well, we gently stretch. We can take days off, of course, but we should be moving just in general. Then activity for health. So we have we're trying to be healthy. That's our goal. So we do have to step it up a little bit. Moderate to vi vigorous intensity, 75 to 150 minutes per week. And that's recommended by all sorts of societies, um, like the American Heart Association and things to, for just general. And that reason that that's recommended, 75 to 150 minutes, actually 150 minutes, well, 150 minutes if it's mild activity, 75 if, or set, hun, sorry, 150 minutes if it's moderate activity, 75 minutes if it's more vigorous, if you're really pushing yourself where you can't breathe. And the reason that that's been a, is because it's, look at the benefits, it's tremendous benefits to do this. So we all should be doing that. Then we exercise for fitness, there's still good benefits. So go running, go hiking, go do your class, aerobics classes or whatever it is that you love, have fun with it, do it. Um, if you can get outdoors, that's great. If not, you can do it in your house. Um, so that's benefits too. There are going to be some risks and all sorts of things from twisting your ankle to a little bit increased inflammation, but, um, really the benefits are tremendous still. And then performance of people training, this is where they start to get injuries. And now the benefits, they have to be really careful and really pay attention to health. So if anyone is, um, in this type, in this category, uh, there are some special considerations for that. Um, so it's really important to be, to have your health in place and then so your body can handle this. Um, we're going to skip that for right now. Plant-based diet is the best. This is some elite athletes. You guys may be familiar with them. Venus Williams and Scott Urich in Colorado. Um, this is Jim Morris, who's a bodybuilder, uh, Patrick Bohemian, who's a heavy man, strong man competition winner, rich role, tons of great things on him. Brandon Bra Brazier, Martina. So just some really great, um, leaders in, in the field and examples for us. So what are the nutrition goals for an athlete? Well, one, they need to meet basic nutritional needs. Um, we want it to be anti-inflammatory, low in oxidative stress, because exercise itself causes oxidative stress. So we want to put that out. Simple, efficient foods, easy to break down, um, rebuild and repair. So we want recovery, right? We want to recover faster. So the faster we recover, the faster we repair ourselves and the faster we can get back and get stronger and faster. And then health promoting. So um, we want to boost the immune system because, um, Endurance athletes and, and hardcore athletes tend to have a little immune suppression and may, and often get sick um, right before their big events or get sick more frequently. So we want to make sure that doesn't happen. And then we want it to be health promoting. We want to don't want to put them at risk for long term effects. Um, this is the basic thing, meat nutritional needs. This is just like every other person. So macronutrients, protein, carbohydrate, and fat, and the micronutrients, the vitamins, the minerals, the antioxidants, the phytochemicals, and the fiber just like everybody else, they need to pay attention to this. And so um, we, when designing a nutrition plan, we want to make sure we cover all of those. Um, so this is why plant-based diet just is hands and, and shoulders above everything else. It's a good source of macro and micronutrients. Um, it, phytonutrients and, and the living enzymes enhance performance and fight disease. It's rich in antioxidants and fiber, and it helps change the microbiome. So it actually supports the immune system and reduces inflammation directly. A well-balanced meal. I, I like to use different plates. Um, so there's a lot of different ideas, but this one is from um, PCRM, Physicians Committee for Responsive Medicine. I actually do it a little bit different. I do vegetables are half of the plate. And fruits are kind of like on the side, like the dessert or a little garnish on the plate. And I do um, half my plate is vegetables, some raw, some cooked. 
and then a quarter might be a, a starchy vegetable or a whole grain and a quarter is a legume with fruit kind of on the side. But it's the idea is you exercise more, the whole plate gets bigger. So you don't just load up on more beans and more fruit, but you also want to have more vegetables because you need more anti-inflammatory. You want to have, and if you're not exercising, you're not going to sit down and eat a huge bowl of grains. you got to keep the proportions where you're getting all the nutrients you need. So um, then we know that our athletes are getting the right amount of nutrients. Um, things that we need to pay attention to in athletes. So we do, we, we talk a lot as vegans or plant-based people that, oh, where do we, where do vegans get their protein? Ha ha ha, it's such a joke. But athletes really do need to pay attention. Um, it's possible to, to eat vegan food. And if you're not eating the enough plants and the right foods that you could be low in protein. So if you're trying to put muscle mass on, you do need to increase your protein intake a little bit. Um, the normal recommended amount is 0.8 milligrams per kilogram. And for athletes, not, not just people doing it for health or fitness, the first couple categories, but the performance athletes actually do need more than the 0.8 to put on the muscle mass. So most of us are not going to need to worry about extra protein, just adequate protein. Um, but we, can, we definitely can do it through plant-based foods. We just have to pay attention. Calcium too. Um, calcium is in all of our vegetables and in beans and whole grains and nuts and seeds. So if you're eating a healthy plant-based diet, which I think you guys are, you're going to get enough calcium. B12, as you guys know, that all um, vegans or plant-based people need extra B12. Vitamin D, same thing. You guys are pretty far north in Wisconsin, just like me in New Hampshire. So we need extra vitamin D. Um, it, it does suppress our immune system. Um, as well as so many other things if, if it's low. Iron, somebody asked a question or I saw something about iron. And um, yeah, so the truth is most athletes in just the health and the fitness category are fine in iron. Um, it's not the studies, they've done multiple studies in vegans and they've not been shown to be lower than um, non-athletes. But there's two caveats to that. One is um, women who are menstruating can have low iron and because they're losing blood and they're making new red blood cells. So often menstruated women, both those who are plant-based and those who are eating animal products can have low iron. So that's one thing we do wanna pay attention to. The other thing is in performance athletes. So I see this in some of my high level athletes when they're running a lot, when they're doing triathlons, when they're in these big events that some of the pounding, cause they're running all the time. Some of that pounding can actually cause red blood cells to break up a little bit and they can be a little bit um, anemic and, and need a little extra iron. So we see that in um, a couple of scenarios. And then actually the other thing I do see it in is patients who have um, gut issues. So a lot of people with irritable bowel syndrome or GERD heartburn. So basically their gut is not digesting as well and it's not absorbing as well. And if that's the case, they may be deficient. So, um, so you want to get it, you may want to get it checked and, and certainly a good screening is just a CBC, a regular blood count. And if you're anemic, then we can talk, look into the iron levels and then we can look into why and then tr and, and help with it. So if you're not deficient, you never want to take extra iron because it's pro-inflammatory. So, um, and it causes oxidative stress. So you only want it if you need it. And, and most people don't need it. Um, so, so just to be aware of that. Zinc, a lot of um, vegans and plant-based people can be low in zinc just because it's harder to absorb it through their vegetables. Um, and so in, in, in plant-based foods. And so we often substitute just a small amount of zinc and zinc is important also for the immune system and for athletes for muscle building. Omega-3 fatty acids, some people need a little extra, some people don't. So um, that's something we can either monitor by symptoms or by, um, by checking levels or um, sometimes we just put people on a small amount of omega-3 fatty acids. And taurine is an amino acid and most people do not need it. So I'm not recommending going out and get a supplement, but in the performance, I just listed it because in the performance athletes, um, taurine is often, it's broken down and excreted from muscle breakdown. So if you get really sore every day and you're having to do these big recoveries, um, the taurine can maybe a little bit low in, in plant-based eaters and that touch of taurine. That's for the super elite athlete though. Most of us who are just um, exercising for fitness or even a little bit more don't need extra taurine. Um, so we don't recommend it for most people. Um, and we're just finishing up here. So plant-based protein, I'm going to skip that one. I'm going to skip calcium, but I'm going to go to um, iron-rich plant foods because there was a question about it. So these are some iron-rich plant foods to pay attention to. So spinach, um, you can see how much there is. And I'll tell you, uh, women need eight grams, eight micrograms a day and men need, I think it's 12. 
I would double check that one, but there's higher amounts here, but we don't absorb it all. So it's not like you're, you eat three cups of spinach, you get 19.2. You're only absorbing a small percentage of that. So um, you, you want to be eating these types of foods regularly throughout the day. And um, so adding a few sesame seeds and eating some beans like edamame and some, maybe a little bit of pumpkin seeds here and there. And one day you have lentils and now, you, you know, so just mixing it up, you're going to get um, iron from plenty of iron from um, your diet. Um, so we want to reduce oxidative stress. It's not a surprise. We're going to skip that. So exercise increases oxidative stress. Vigorous exercises increases your lactic acid and your reactive oxidase species um, buildup just by exercising. Every time you contract a muscle, every time you're breathing faster, you are building up your um, oxidative stress and your lactic acid, which is acidic. This is very acidic when we do this. So um, your body becomes a little more acidic. So eating alkaline foods, eating these anti-inflammatory foods, eating um, extra um, antioxidants is really important for exercise. Um, hopefully most of us aren't eating too much animal protein intake because it actually is really harsh. The acidity of it is really hard in the body and it's harder to digest. We want an e easy to digest protein like from, amino for like from beans or tofu or whole grains or vegetables um, that's not nearly so acidic and comes with all the benefits. Um, we're going to finish up very soon. Bright colors, are your antioxidants. So this is what you want to eat after and before a good workout. So you want to um, make sure your meals are colorful, make sure you're getting some raw vegetables in and, you know, maybe eat some fresh fruit and then you cook your vegetables a little bit too. So make sure you're getting those colors in. Easy to digest foods. This is really important. You want to use your energy to repair muscle mass and to, um, to, to, few, to dilate your blood vessels and flow blood all throughout your body, you don't want to use your energy to be digesting and breaking down the protein you just ate into amino acids. And then, you know, so these heavy, hard foods, even things like oils. Um, so the lighter you eat can be helpful right before or right after a workout type thing, especially. So this is just to show you how acidifying and alkalizing food is. Um, we're supposed to eat a little bit of, of alkalizing. It's okay to, you know, if you have a cup of tea or coffee, if you have a, some whole grains here, um, a little bit of beans or a little more alkalizing, acidifying, but um, the, uh, all the vegetables, all the fruits, these are going to be, so if you predominantly eat a lot of this type of stuff, you're going to be in a good place for, um, and I'm going to finish up. Oh, the last thing I'm going to finish up right here is a good way to finish. So this is Rich Roll who, um, <coughs> And he has, um, he says, I can state with full confidence that an alkaline plant-based whole food diet is the most rapid recovery tool available to the athlete and a crucial component to his success. So um, it's been shown that it's, it increases recovery for athletes, um, improves the immune system, hormones, and just they're able to have less injuries and just get back out there faster. So um, I have a whole bunch on types of foods that I recommend and meals and, and how to plan for it to increase certain nutrients. But um, I think this is a good place to end. And hopefully if people aren't fully plant-based or are working on it, we'll remember to keep a diverse diet and um, really eat these antioxidants and the phytonutrients and, and uh, make sure you pay attention to these different nutrients. And I am going to um, end my stop share. There we go. And that is my talk in a nutshell. And I'm sorry about the hodgepodge, but I couldn't help getting excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. That was information rich, uh, delivered in a way that was uh, relatively easy to uh, easy to pick up with the, with the graphics there as well, Dr. Miller. So thank we, you. Um, I never know when I'm, because I talk fast and I apologize. I think that's the ear doctor in me that I'm used to not having a lot of time. And I want to share this with you guys so badly. So I try to get as much as I can out. So hopefully you could follow that. Well, here is, uh, let's jump into, we'll, we'll try to get, uh, stay as close to that 7.30 as possible, but uh, you can put in questions now. Let's see, there was a, um, okay, um, Angela asked, can one have a blood test to determine taurine levels? You can, yes, you can do blood tests to check amino acids. Mm -hmm. So we can get a sense of, and we often check things like omega-3 fatty acids and amino acids, especially if there's an athlete, if you're, if people are pushing it or wondering, or yeah, we can do all sorts of things like that. Uh, Steve was uh, mentioned, I'm two months into a three month treatment course for viral pericarditis, I think. Mm -hmm. 
uh, key is two anti-inflammatory drugs. Only recently putting several days in a row without symptoms. Any Good. diet or exercise treatments you would suggest? Yeah, so pericarditis, I don't know if that's found COVID, but there's actually some new guidelines coming out with COVID and pericarditis. Um, so pericarditis, for those who don't know, is inflammation of the pericardial sac, the outside part of the heart. And that in itself is not too dangerous, except it's very painful and can cause a little shortness of breath. So, um, but typically if you get that inflammation out, people typically do okay with that. But what can happen is it can get into the myocardium, the inside muscle layer, and then it's just all sorts of problems can happen. And then people get really sick. And um, so you want to, you want to get rid of that. And, and it's terribly uncomfortable and painful as well. So Anti-inflammatory is the way to go, absolutely. And so they're treating that with anti-inflammatory medications um, and just having anti-inflammatory diet. So exactly what I showed you. So I would do things like, um, I would do the green smoothies, maybe eating the raw vegetables. And I would incorporate even green juices if you can. Um, and the green juices are things like celery and um, cucumber, maybe a touch of lemon to make it taste good or a touch of ginger, a touch of turmeric, not too much. It gets bitter fast and a touch of, um, uh, the crucifer. So maybe put a touch of cabbage in or, uh, bok choy or something like that. Not a lot. You don't want to juice too much of the crucifers, but just a little bit. It's that's powerfully anti-inflammatory. Um, and, and in, in addition to that, fasting is also very anti-inflammatory. It's actually inflammatory to eat. So, uh, you want to eat a little bit less or, stop eating earlier in the day. Maybe you can eat dinner to like four or five, like stop eating then and skip the evening kind of later eating and don't eat again to like eight the next morning. That time you're not eating, your body is actually able to put out inflammation. So it's a tool I use for a lot of people when they're very inflamed. Um, I use the juicing for them and and the um, watching how much we're eating just for that little bit of time. And we can usually qu pretty quickly help quiet it down. But your anti-inflammatories are helping, I'm sure. So, um, and as long as we keep you from getting worse. And then once it gets better and goes away, then you're on a good, nice, healthy, plant-based diet with all these wonderful tips that we talked about. Um, Well-balanced, the things you guys are learning every week, right? Or every month right here. And this, this is exactly the type of thing that's good in the long run. I think you said in there that uh, that eating is uh, anti-inflammatory. Did you mean it's inflammatory? Eating is pro-inflammatory. That's what I meant to say. And and even if we're eating these anti-inflammatory foods, the eating itself can cause just a smidge of inflammation. If you already have this inflammatory body, even you want to be real careful how much you eat. So if you eat and you chew it to a pulp and you don't eat too much, you feel fine. But if you start overeating or you're eating too much, you know, grains and beans and these big that itself can, it's, it's not necessarily pro-inflammatory, but it's not putting out the inflammation. So if you want to put out the inflammation, your body really has repair techniques when we're not eating all the time. So it's hard for me. I love to eat even plant-based foods, but I have a lot of inflammation. So I've had pericarditis. I've had a lot of these symptoms myself. And I found that just not eating and drink juicing and just kind of taking easy a little meditation, some gentle music, not being so harsh on myself with all these deadlines and responsibility, you know, just kind of quieting things down and the inflammation can get better pretty quickly with those tools and with the anti-inflammatory medications. Um, and, but if I, if I just keep going and eating normally and keeping up with my busy lifestyle, it can persist forever and it just doesn't get better. So um, those are tools that you can use. Uh, just a couple other things here. I've noticed my, uh, Lori mentioned, I've noticed my athletic performance has improved dramatically from going plant-based. And, and thank you, Dr. Miller. And there's some thank yous. And um, will you make these slides available? Um, uh, I'll address that real quickly. Uh, we are going to make the uh, this um, talk, uh, the recording of the talk available to everybody. And, uh, but that may not be for a few days yet. I don't know if uh, Dr. Miller, if these slides are something that are, if, it, if, you, if you have them in a format, uh, you, you can let me know and I can pass. Okay, I'm not sure if they are or not, um, but I can definitely look into it and share some of that information, especially stuff we didn't quite get to today. Uh, Becky mentioned uh, adding turmeric and, and ginger. Yep, great. Or uh, to reduce the inflammation or anti-inflammatory. Um, let's see, I wanted to ask uh, real quickly, tofu, better raw or cooked, or does it make a difference? I think you can eat it either way. Um, 
So raw, you know, people are doing a lot of raw healing diets with um, autoimmune, like people, Dr. Brooke Holner, who I think you've had. So she advocates for raw tofu um, in that program. And so you can add things like garlic to it or or maybe touch a coconut aminos, or um, I like to add curry powder to it um, and a little celery and make like a curry tofu salad. And it's almost like a curry tuna salad type thing and put it on my regular salad. And it's delicious. A little lemon juice, a little mustard. I have that recipe on my website if anyone's interested in that. And that's raw tofu. Um, but it's okay to cook it too. Just lightly cook it. If you brown it or make it too crispy, which is how I used to like it, um, then you're getting, it's pro-inflammatory, right? Those, those are, um, can uh, actually cause some inflammation. So you just want to lightly kind of dry it out a little bit and yeah, that's good for you too. Wonderful. It's a wonderful food if people aren't sensitive to it. And you were talking about, and you may have covered this, uh, uh, you were talking about the different things for iron, uh, but that our absorption is kind of low. Um, is there anything to take? I think you might've mentioned vitamin C or something like that, that would enhance the absorption. Yeah, that's exactly right. So squeezing vitamin, squeezing um, a little bit of lemon. So if you're eating spinach with a lemon dressing or, um, you know, using some citrus, but actually vitamin C is in all of your, um, you eat some broccoli, there's, it's packed with vitamin C. You put some red bell peppers on, it's packed with vitamin C. So, but adding vitamin C with your um, iron helps absorb it. That's absolutely correct. Yep, good point. And not, not having your iron rich foods with tea, tea actually inhibits the absorption of iron. So um, separate your tea by a couple hours, like I would say two hours, like, or, or even an hour is probably okay, but have your tea in the morning and then your, your iron a little bit later or vice versa. And uh, there was a question about your website, but uh, Becky and Warren uh, popped it up here on the uh, chat. You. So that is the eatandlivehealthfully.com. Yeah. Thank you. I just started a new newsletter and I wrote a blog about what I talked about today with the immune response because um, I thought it was so fascinating. So there's more information on it there if you guys want and um, through the website. Thanks to Becky and Warren for that. And uh, thank and we're just about there, 728. So thank you, Dr. Miller. This was outstanding. And boy, you packed a lot in in, the, in that period of time, both in the talk and uh, it, it, there are so few people who can, I think, who can talk at that speed and be understood. And you are in. I start to stutter when I talk fast. So I have to slow myself down and like think about what I'm saying. But I really want you guys to have that information. And I would say, um, I know we didn't get to everything. And feel free to email me through my website. I do respond to it um, sometimes at the end of the day or the next morning if I'm busy. But um, I will look at it and try to get back to you. And um, yeah, so you can check it. And you can make appointments with me too if you have some more specific questions. But otherwise, there's information, a little bit of information on my website. I'm updating it.